Hi, my name is Kristen Bernard and I'm an assistant professor in the Department of Psychology at Stony Brook University. Much of my research focuses on early adversity and how adversity, especially in the first few years of life, affects children's development. When we think about early adversity, that can refer to a number of different experiences, like experiencing abuse or neglect, experiencing a parent who has mental illness or witnessing domestic violence in the home, or even chronic stressors in the environment, like exposure to poverty or homelessness. And these stressors can get in the way of healthy development. They undermine basic aspects of um, children's biological regulation that have implications for healthy brain development. There are a number of outcomes associated with exposure to early adversity, like problems with mental health, like depression and anxiety, problems with physical health, like obesity, and even problems in the classroom, like difficulty focusing and difficulty learning. So when we think about how to prevent some of these problems from occurring later in life after children have been exposed to adversity, uh, there are two, two areas of research that I think are really important. One of those is identifying mechanisms. So when a child is exposed to stress, how does that really impact their body and their brain in ways that have lasting consequences for development? And the second is what factors can protect, what factors can promote resilience among children who are exposed to adversity? Thinking about that first, that first piece, the mechanisms, the how of how adversity affects development, one of the key systems that we've looked at is the HPA axis or hypothalamic pituitary adrenal cortical axis. This is one of the body's stress response systems and is responsible for regulating the production of a hormone called cortisol. Typically, we have high levels of cortisol in the morning when we wake up and low levels at bedtime before we go to sleep. And this healthy rhythm across the day, this steep decline from high morning to low evening cortisol supports basic functions in the body like temperature regulation and immune system functioning and even healthy brain development. What we see when children are exposed to high levels of adversity in their environments is that these rhythms of cortisol can become disrupted or dysregulated. Instead of having high levels of cortisol when they wake up in the morning, they might show bl blunted or low levels of waking cortisol. Part of what we've looked at in my research lab and a lot of people have started to look at in the field is what are the implications of these atypical cortisol levels for healthy development? One of the outcomes that we see as a result of low cortisol levels in the morning in particular is that children struggle with executive functions, children struggle with em uh, emotion regulation, and even other aspects of behavioral control. And of course, those have clear implications for how well children can do in school. If you're struggling with executive functioning or behavioral control, it's really hard to sit still in a classroom and pay attention and learn. So moving on to, to what protects children in the face of adversity, one of the biggest sources of protection, especially early in life, um, is parents. Um, parents who are responsive and sensitive to children's cues set up in an environment that helps shape um, normal and typical development, even in the context of stress. So when children have a partner um, who is responsive to their cues, who is nurturing when they're distressed, who follows their lead, they can be protected or buffered against the exposures to stress in the environment. Unfortunately though, many children that are exposed to adversity are unlikely to receive this sensitive and responsive caregiving. Their parents may be affected by the same stressors that they're being affected by, whether it's poverty or mental illness or unemployment. Um, and so these parents who are caring for children who are especially in need of sensitive care need support. They need extra help to be able to provide that kind of care for their children. One of the things that we do is provide support to parents in the form of home-based parenting interventions. An example of a type of program that we, we do in my lab and study in my lab is called Attachment and Biobehavioral Catch-Up, or ABC for short. And this program specifically in a very targeted way tries to support parents in being sensitive parents. Um, instead of just telling people to be sensitive or teaching people to be sensitive, what we do is actually coach parents during their moment-to-moment -moment interactions with their babies. 
So a parent coach goes into the home and watches for all of the seemingly ordinary moments when a parent picks up a crying baby or follows the baby's lead by clapping along with when the baby claps. And the parent coach provides feedback on those interactions, says that's a great example of being nurturing. When you picked him up as he was crying, that's teaching him he can trust you. Or that was a great example of following his lead. When he handed you that block and you took it right from him, that's building up his brain development. And these moment to moment interactions really shape healthy development. So when we support parents, um, in supporting their children, we're, we're potentially reshaping these problematic trajectories that can follow from early adversity.